that Jesus is coming again and looking for him is the most important thing. You guys can go back to your seats. I want to thank Kristen for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, Kristen, what a blessing it is to have you here. She's usually at GCA, uh, uh, one of the students down there at our academy, our boarding school, which is in Calhoun, Georgia, just down the road about an hour. And so anytime we can see Kristen or any of your siblings here, it's a tremendous blessing. So uh, thank God for uh, our young people, thank God uh, that we've been given the chance today uh, to have a church uh, that believes in young people. Well, just in case today you're here uh, visiting and just uh, checking out Standard for Gap, uh, if you're ever, I mean, I'm just, just guessing here, there may be somebody here that may be thinking, you know, I don't have a church family, I don't have a church home, and I'm looking for a place to settle down. Well, we'd love to have you here at Standard for Gap, um, and, and we'll even shake your hand. <laughs> we'll do whatever. Um, it's good to see Christine there. Just a few weeks ago, uh, she was accepted into membership here. If you would like to uh, facilitate the process of allowing your membership to be here, uh, please take this card today and fill it out and put it in the uh, brown box in the back, or you can give it to me. And we'll do what we can uh, to make it possible for you to join our church family. Now, if you want to just continue to come and spectate and just watch us, that's fine, too. Uh, there's no pressure here unless it's the Holy Spirit pressure. Uh, that's a different story, but uh, you won't get the pressure from Pastor Mallory. I will tell you that the Holy Spirit pressure has been working on two people here in the front, uh, uh, Debbie and Gary. Wow, God has been working in your heart, and because of what the Spirit of God's doing, next week, listen to this, next week, church family, they're getting baptized. Isn't that cool? That's really cool. <laughs> and we want you to know that you're invited to come. Um, they've got some family that are coming. Uh, it's going to be a very special Sabbath. We were going to do communion next Sabbath, but we switched it so that we could get more time um, to, for us to hear their story, which is a powerful story of how God's been leading. Um, and so, yeah, if, if you have plans for next week, that's one thing. But if you don't know what's going on and you're looking for a place to come, yeah, it'll be worth coming next Sabbath. Trust me, uh, God has really done a wonderful uh, thing in their life. And, and they're excited about sharing that, but they're also excited about getting in the tank and, and, and making that decision for Jesus. Just want to share with you, if you've never made that decision for Jesus and you're thinking that, hey, now it's my time uh, to start thinking about that, baptism is a very precious thing. And I've enjoyed working with Gary and Debbie, and I know P Pam has also. Uh, but fill this card out. If that's you, just say, hey, Pastor Malley, I think it's time. I'm ready to start the process. I want to get back to God, whatever. Just that's my communication tool uh, with you. So take advantage of this card if you would. I want to share with you, last Sabbath, I was not here. I had the privilege to be at a place. How many of you have ever been to Camp Calacqua in Florida? A tough place to be for spring break, right? <laughs> Actually, I was down there for a men's retreat. Uh, one of the things that I do as pastor in this area is I'm the regional men's ministry leader. And so uh, I went down there to kind of spy out the land and uh, to, to kind of see what they do in the Florida Conference for Men's Ministry. And uh, I was really impressed. Get this, look at this picture. Uh, I took this picture. It's hard to see. Maybe we need to trim the lights a little bit. Thank you. Appreciate those people upstairs, don't you? Um, this, is, uh, this was Friday night, uh, and then Sabbath morning got even more. They had, uh, get this, 700 men. 700 men all came together. Um, Pastor Brandon, uh, you might have known some of them. Uh, I'm not sure. Some of you are from Florida. But uh, they've been doing this for 24 years. Now, next year is their 25th anniversary. Now, here's the thing. They told me, they said, when we first started out, we started out with six. <laughs> so they've been growing it for quite a while. And so uh, it's, it was a real treat to be down there. This is what we're hoping to do in this conference. We're hoping to be able to grow ours. We currently 
Uh, well, last year we did not have a men's retreat, but usually when we do do it, um, yeah, we probably usually have about 50 to 70 people. Uh, we're trying to grow it, and so uh, pray about that. We have a men's ministry here in the church. Some of you know about that. Uh, Adam's not here today, and he could tell you more about it. But there's one ministry. Chad, come on up. I, I, you know, I was just so excited when Chad said that he would be willing to help us with our prayer ministry here at the church. And, and you know how it goes with uh, prayer, right? Much power equals, much prayer equals much power. Little prayer equals little power. And so my thinking is, is that we need as much prayer as we can get. Do you agree? <laughs> and so here in the church, we have somebody called a, a prayer coordinator, and that's what Chad does. Chad, just share with us what God has put on your heart for our church. Good morning, everyone. Uh, about a month ago, I think it was, um, the pastor and I attended uh, the prayer conference that's held um, by the uh, Georgia Cumberland Conference, and it was a true blessing. I recommend it for anyone. Uh, if they can go next year, I learned things about prayer that I hadn't learned. And I've been a Christian, growing up in the church my whole life. Um, one of the things that the speaker highlighted was the importance of intercessory prayer during the worship service. Now, this, this is a concept that I hadn't been familiar with before, but he really highlighted the importance of having um, a group of people who feel convicted by God to come together and to pray over the church during the worship service, during the entire worship service. So I, when listening to this, I felt convicted that I wanted to be one of the people, not just as a prayer coordinator, but as a member of this church, to lift up the church and each of its members uh, before the Lord and pray over everyone um, on Sabbath. And uh, we're looking for people who feel that same conviction. Um, if you don't worry about you know, missing out on a blessing or uh, you're going to miss any part of the service, if you have any questions, you can see myself or the pastor. Um, and pastor's going to talk a little bit more about the significance of intercessory prayer during the worship service. Um, but we're being very intentional and in offering this to anyone who's interested and see me or the pastor about this. So, Chad, real quickly, um, this will be something that you do during church service. Yes. Like, what time would you start? We would meet um, just around, um, for church after Sabbath school. Okay. Um, we're gonna. We haven't had a room set up yet, but we're gonna get together with uh, people that are assigned for that week and spend the entire time in prayer. Uh, maybe some singing and some sharing. Um, and then we'll conclude um, around the time of when the final song um, ends. Okay, good, good. And another thing that some may wonder is that when it comes to this prayer thing, um, you won't be able to hear the sermon. So maybe you're wondering how well I'd be able to get what I missed. Well, thanks to John Beckett and the team upstairs, we do stream our service so you can go back and get it in the archive and watch it that way too. Absolutely, and, so. and um, if, if you haven't, you know, if you're also worried about, you know, I've never prayed for maybe you know a whole hour or something before. <laughs> um, people that you know give their testimony about it said, you know, it goes a lot faster than you think, and it, it really is a true blessing. So you're not going to miss out on anything. You're gonna, it's going to be a blessing for you as well as um, everyone else. Amen. Here. Amen. Thank you, Chad. Can you say amen to that? That's tremendous stuff. Um, some of you realize that what we do in, in, in the worship hour from normally 11 to 12, which we usually call it, um, is, a, is very important. It's tremendous stuff. Uh, this week I had a chance to read something that made me think that what Chad's doing, what's, what he wants to do, is very important for us to embrace. And I want to share with you the quote here. It's uh, taken from a book that... Uh, some of you've read before. You ever read this book before? It's called The Great Controversy. You've seen it, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a good old standby book. Uh, it probably wouldn't hurt. I'm just going to recommend this uh, to maybe read a little bit of this. Uh, it's amazing how much uh, what the Lord spoke uh, through this individual, how some of these things, uh, yeah, are coming right in front of us. They're happening. Uh, so it makes me think that we're living in the time of the end. But, but watch this. It says, The scriptures declare that upon one occasion when the angels of God came to present, present themselves before the Lord, Satan came also among them, not to bow before the eternal king, that makes sense, but to further his own malicious designs against the righteous. 
Now, I know you've probably read the story of Job, and I'm not preaching on Job today, but, but I will tell you it's interesting that uh, this is essentially an assembly, a gathering of God's people to worship God, and guess who shows up? Now, you know, Satan did that in Job's day. Do you think that he might do the same today, church? I see you here today, and you see me here. Could Satan show up on Saturday morning at Standing for Gap? Ooh, man. So let's, let's read on here. It says, with the same object, object, he is in attendance when men and women assemble for the worship of God. Wow. I mean, read that again. With the same object, he is in attendance when men assemble for the worship of God. Though hidden from sight, he is working with all diligence. Read with me in the next part. To control the minds of the worshipers. Whoa. <laughs> Have you, did you realize that? That he's here to try to control your mind? Whoa. Whoa. Like a skillful general, he lays his plans beforehand. As he sees the messenger of God searching the scriptures, he takes note of the subject to be presented uh, to the people. As he sees Pastor Mallory praying through what he's supposed to speak, uh, what God wants him to speak on Sabbath, he takes note of that. Then he employs all his cunning and shrewdness so to control circumstances that the message may not reach those whom he's deceiving on that very point. Wow. Man. So you see the battle between good and evil. It's happening even right here. The one who most needs the warning will be urged into some business transaction which requires his presence or will by some other means be prevented from hearing the words that might prove to him or her a savor of life unto life. Wow. <laughs> this is huge. Have you ever wondered why it's so hard to get out of the bed on Saturday morning? <laughs> Especially this morning, right? Because of the time change. Have you ever felt like you were trying to get to church, but your, your, your feet are, are kind of stuck in quicksand and things aren't moving as fast as you want them to? Everything goes chaotic. It gets crazy. Friends, I just want you to know, I think the reason sometimes for all of that is because the devil is working, because he knows that if you show up here at church for that hour, even Sabbath school, that God has something for you, and you need it desperately. Boy, one of everybody that were believers, that were Christians, believed this wholeheartedly. Can you imagine how many people would be at church if they really believed that God had, had put together something just exactly what they needed? And you know what? If they didn't show, they would miss out on the blessing. Ah, this is inspired stuff. He, intent, he tempts men to the indulgence of appetite or to some other forms of self-gratification. And thus, he benumbs their sensibilities so that they fail to hear the very things which they most need to learn. <laughs> and so, in other words, the day before you're supposed to meet with God, the devil's going to try to do his best to mess you up. Trust me, friends. If it was a race, if it was a marathon, the day before, you do things that will help you to be fresh for the next day. And so it is. Preparation day should be just like that. We should be thinking about things that we can do to be sharp, uh, which may mean go to bed a little earlier. Don't eat a heavy supper. Just practical things so that we can sleep well, so that when we get up on Sabbath morning, we just jump up and say, Amen. Praise Jesus. I'm going to church today. <laughs> no, that's the ideal, all right? <laughs> We're, uh, sanctification is the work of a lifetime. And so 
I'm just being really honest with you here. God is wanting us to treat this hour very, very special. When somebody gets married, that hour, their wedding, they put so much time and prep into it. Why shouldn't we do the same when it comes to meeting with God on Sabbath morning? Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and the searching of scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. Therefore, he invents every possible device to engross the mind. Oh, boy, I could say more. The whole quote is full. Just go back, and you can read that. Uh, it's called Snares of Satan. That's the chapter title in the book, Great Controversy. Today, I want to pray right now with you, and I want to invite you as you pray to pray for me, and I'm going to pray for you. So let's bow our heads. Father, we, we always pray before we begin the sermon. It's it's something that we know that we should do, but I think even now we know we should do it even more um, because we know there's a battle going on. And Lord, in a lot of ways, Satan's really lost if we're here today. Um, we made it, praise the Lord, but just showing up and being here physically doesn't mean, mean that we're mentally here. It doesn't mean that uh, our focus is where it needs to be. So we need your help today. We need the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. And just thank you so much that you've made it possible through your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to share with you today's sermon. It's called Storm Stories. The word today, boys and girls, is storm. So try to keep track of how many times I come up with that word. And then at the end, if I can remember, I'll give you the answer on that. I want to begin today by taking you up on the screen with your eyes. Uh, look up here on the screen, uh, wherever best fits you. It doesn't matter which screen. But I want you to notice here today a text in John 6, 30, 16, 33. John 16, 33, Jesus is speaking. And I want to invite you to read it with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So, obviously when you read this one verse, it's quite loaded. There's a lot of things here, and I'm not going to exhaust it here today. Just the, the first part, these things makes you wonder, what is Jesus talking about? Well, you need to read the context. Go back in uh, chapter 16 and chapter 15 and even chapter 14. Um, and if, if you do that, you will see a few things that kind of repeat more than once. And one of the things that's very clear, Jesus wanted to make this clear to his followers back then, is that the times ahead are not going to be easy. But for every challenge... You can pray to God, and he will help you with those challenges. Now, that's just a little summary of what these things could mean. So because of that, I, I've spoken to you these things that, that in me, that in Christ, notice it said, in Christ, you may have, what's that word? Peace. Peace. Now, friends, if you've got it, you know what it is. But if you don't have it, you don't understand it. The peace, say it with me, that passes all what? Understanding. That's the peace of God. When I first became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, <laughs> that was a, the best thing that happened to me. God gave me his peace. It changed everything. My heart was just so warmed. I had peace on the inside. It didn't mean that there was peaceful situations on the outside all the time, but on the inside, everything was peaceful. But continuing here, this is what it says, in the world, in the cosmos, Greek here, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So, here's the question. What is God trying to say through this final part? Let me just stay faithful to Scripture here today. I'm the, I'm a kind of the kind of pastor that I won't, don't want to uh, divvy away from what God is saying, but I just want you to know, he says, in the world, emphasizing here, in the world, you will 
Now notice that it doesn't say you may, but it says you will. You can count on it, disciples. You can count on it, Standard for Gap Church family, that you're going to have something called what? Tribulation. Or trouble. It's interesting, when I did some background research here on the word tribulation, the original Greek meaning, this will just blow you away, the original Greek, when you look at the building of this word tribulation in the Greek, it, it means pressure. Pressure. <laughs> now think about that, where you are right now. Pressure. What's been going on in your life? Pressure. In the world, you will have tribulation or you will have pressure. Now, it's just interesting when you think of how we use pressure today. If some of you keep track of the weather, what happens when a low pressure system collides with a high pressure system? <laughs> you know where I'm going, don't you? There's a storm that's going to come when that happens. And so, in other words, using another way of reading this, he says, in the world, the place where you live, Chattanooga, Cleveland, Harrison, wherever, in the world where you live, the place where you function, where you go to school, where you work, even your own home, you will have tribulation, you will have pressure, or you will have storms. It's not an if, it's just a matter of when. You're going to have some stormy moments. So, since I've been preaching here for the last few Sabbaths, I wasn't here last Sabbath, I was happy to have Andrew here on the pulpit, I've been talking to you a little bit about storms. Interesting to me, if you keep up with the Weather Channel, uh, you probably have met this guy before, Jim Cantori. Um, you've watched him report on weather all over the place. Uh, the guy's pretty brave, isn't he? <laughs> I remember one time watching him before a, 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 a hurricane struck off the coast somewhere, and, and he had the mic and everything, and the wind was blowing him, and he was kind of slanting like this because the wind was blowing him all over the place. And so he's a pretty brave guy. I think he works out. Uh, <laughs> pretty strong, but they have, the Weather Channel has chosen a long time ago, a number of years ago, to put together a program, a series of programs talking about stories of people that survived storms. Now, how many of you remember the story of the Miracle Mud Baby? Do you remember that story? You do? Okay, this was back in May of 1999. It was in Oklahoma, near Moore, Oklahoma. And some of you know, that's considered tornado what? <laughs> Alley. It's amazing that anybody would want to live there. Matt, I'm not sure if your truck goes through Oklahoma, but maybe I should pray for you more <laughs> during the springtime. But a really bad tornado hit. It came, and it hit this area. Well, it just happens to be that there was a mother that had a baby that was trying to seek shelter, and as she was taking the baby to find a place to go, the storm came, became so unbearable that the, the thing you never want to have happen as a mom, the baby blew out of her hands. I mean, it was that bad. They said uh, they, they clocked the speed of the tornado up in the atmosphere. It was like 300 miles per hour up, up there. So on the ground, it was probably close to 200. I mean, so you're talking tremendous wind speed. And so she, she loses sight of the baby. Uh, eventually, they come to take her to the hospital. But before she leaves, she says, Deputy, uh, she says, is there any way you could look for my baby? Because I lost my baby. Now, you've got to understand at this time, the, the house is all down to the ground. It's decimated. I mean, it's just a terrible place. Uh, I mean, the destruction is just, yeah, it's, it's really bad. And so this deputy starts looking for this baby, and would you believe, would you believe a hundred yards from where the house was, he, he looked down and he saw something that looked like a child. 
and he brushed it off, and it was the baby. It was ma the mama's baby that had blown out of her hand. Somehow, some way, that baby survived. Can you believe that? Somehow, some way, by the grace of God, mom says, her baby survived this story. Well, they did an interview with the, the baby who grew up to become a teenager, and this is her a few years ago. Her name's Aaliyah. Interesting. Um, and, and she talks about that story. Well, this is what's interesting about storm stories on the Weather Channel, and that is, is that they have the story. Sometimes they have to reenact it, but the beauty of it is they have the, the, the person after the storm talk about how they got through the storm and what it's done since, what that experience has done to them since that time. Whoa, I looked at that and I thought, man, yeah, could that be the case in the storms of life? Could it be, friends, that, that yeah, each one of us, each one of us, just like Aaliyah, we have a storm story too. Something that we've gone through in life that was hard, that was a tribulation, a trial, a challenge, whatever you want to call it, that God helped us to get through. And today, because of that, we have a story to tell. Well, let me just share with you today, as I was looking at the scripture, I was very familiar with uh, an individual in the Bible. His name is Joseph. Joseph in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, I'm going to invite you to turn there in your Bible or on your device. Um, I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. In Genesis chapter 37, um, we're going to not read all these verses, trust me, but we're just going to go back and kind of highlight a few things about the life of Joseph. Notice it, it says in Genesis 37 verse 2, this is the history of Jacob. And then it mentions the name of Joseph. He was 17 years old, Genesis chapter 37, verse 2. He was feeding the flock with his what? His brothers. I mean, so this is a, a family thing that's happening. Um, I'm not sure how often they did this, but uh, one day uh, something became very apparent. In verse 3, it says his dad loved him. In Genesis 37, 3, his dad loved him, loved Joseph more than all his children uh, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. Uh, so you can see that there's some favoritism going on here. <laughs> and so uh, it says, verse 4, but when his brothers saw that their father, their father loved him more than all his brothers, they were just thrilled. They were so excited. Is that what it says? No. It says they hated him. Pretty strong word there. They hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, if I had... <laughs> if knowing, knowing the story like I know it, if Joseph would have had the gift of discernment, I think he would have just stopped there um, and given some time, allowed some time to go by before he says the next part. But evidently, um, he makes a choice here that comes back to haunt him. He talks about a dream. Verse 5, he, Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. It's one thing to have the dream, but he told it to his brothers. And notice it says they were just thrilled with that dream, right? <laughs> And no, it's the total opposite. It's even more. They hated him even more. Verse 6, so he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamt. And there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around. And then the next part says, and what? And bowed, and bowed down to my sheaf. Now, definitely Joseph has got the gift of prophecy going on here. Um, but you know what? <laughs> as good as it was, it wasn't the time to share all of this, and it did not set well with his brothers. Uh, verse 8, and his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? 
Uh, <laughs> so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And then if that wasn't enough, he had another dream. And then he dreamed still another dream, and he told it again, okay? He needed the gift of discernment, didn't he? And he said, look, I dreamt, dreamt another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it this time to his daddy, verse 10, and his brothers and his, fathers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamt? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now, friends, I just want you to know that this is a great dream that God had given to Joseph about his future. It, it pretty much tells him that, hey, you're going to be successful. You're going to make it in life. And you know what? It's always true when you have a great dream or a great vision, a great future. You get excited about living that. Uh, you want it to happen instantly. But here's what I want you to know. The reality of this dream actually happening to Joseph would not happen until 21 years after this episode. Whoa. It was going to take 21 years for this to become a reality where Joseph would be a leader and, and those um, in, among, around him, even his family, would bow down in respect to him. 21 years? That's a long time, isn't it? Anybody here 21? <laughs> yeah, 21 years. So right away, I, I, I just, I, th I thought about this. Sometimes when we, when we have aspirations and we want to do things for God, sometimes they just don't happen overnight. Sometimes things don't happen quick enough. 21 years is a long time, but maybe you're dealing with something that you've been waiting even longer for something to show up, for God to show up. Maybe that significant other. You've been praying, and, and you have faith to believe that uh, at some point uh, you're going to marry somebody, and, and they're going to bow down to you maybe. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe it's the opposite, all right? <laughs> at some point it's going to happen, but... You get your phone out, and you look at the date, and it's March 18, 2017, and your Romeo has not shown up yet. Yeah. Where? God, are you listening? Are you there? He is. You betcha. He is. Here's what I know, and just listen to me, and I'm on the journey with you, and that is that sometimes before God allows something great to happen in your life, he takes you down a path to prepare you for that. And as much as you hate the process to get to the goal, sometimes the process is just as beautiful as getting the goal. Do you hear me? And so we don't like to wait for God's plan to just all of a sudden unfold before us. No, nobody wants to wait. We like it fast. But the truth of the matter is there's value in waiting, the process, patiently waiting and trusting that in God's time, he will make everything what? He will make everything beautiful. In his time, not my time, not your time, but in his time, he will make everything beautiful. But listen to me, church family. My heart goes out to you today. Because I know some of you are dealing with stuff right now. But listen to me. Before the beauty, sometimes it gets ugly. Sometimes it gets really ugly before the beauty comes. This was Joseph. That explains his life. He had the vision, a great future. Someday he would be what we would call in the White House, or close to the White House. Yeah, it's pretty clear. The handwriting's on the wall. But before that happened, it got really ugly. And another word that I want to use today for ugliness is stormy. It got really stormy. So you go back to Genesis 37. 
uh, it came to pass, verse 23, they finally, you know, they had enough of Joseph. It came to pass <laughs> when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped, they stripped Joseph of that nice coat. They stripped him of his tunic, the tunic of, of many colors that was on him. And then they took him and they cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty and there was no water in it. Now, friends, think about this. If they would initially have their way and everything would have gone as they initially thought, guess what would have happened to Joseph? <laughs> Joseph would have died in the pit. The naysayers would have said, well, that just goes to show you, you can't trust God because there he is. He's in the pit and he's dying. There's just no hope. But here's what I know. And that is, is that even you may be in an ugly situation, you may be in a pit, but you're not out of the hand or reach of God. Do you hear me, church family, today? <laughs> and, 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 and if you're in the pit, and some of you are now, you're in that pit, and you're thinking, man, God, I, I, there's not much I can do right now. True, true. Yeah, I agree. There's not much you can do right now. But just because you're in the pit doesn't mean that God cannot still work through the pit. In the world you will have what? Tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have what? I have overcome what? The world. His victories are victory. Friends, I just want you to know it's that when God's in the equation, things can change. As bad as the pit may be, listen to me. God will get you through it. Oh, man. This is good news. It's really good news. Because for Joseph, it didn't look like it was going far. And, you know, we can go on further and we can talk further. We don't have the time today to talk about his experience, uh, how eventually the brothers felt bad about keeping him in that pit. Uh, so these traitors in verse 28, they pass by and the brothers pulled Joseph up and, and they lifted him up out of the, that pit and they sold him. They sold him. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Again, I mean, the naysayers are looking. You know, he's going to Egypt. It's in, in Egypt was this, uh, synonymous with a place where they don't serve God. They don't worship the God of heaven. Uh, yeah, it just looks... Listen to the word that I'm going to use right now. It, it, it looks very bleak. There's just, I mean, you, you, don't, you, you don't get the impression that this is going in the right direction. In fact, if it was a movie and you were watching the movie at home, you would pretty much think, you know what? If this wasn't Hollywood, I'd turn it off. Usually, Hollywood tries to bring the story back around. But, but looking at this initially, you would think, no, no, no. This is, this is not going to go the way it was prophesied. Ooh. This is not to go. It's going to go the way it was prophesied. But, again, God was still there. They eventually, verse 36, they sold him into Egypt. He should have died. Eventually, he goes to Potiphar. Now, interesting to me there is that he ends up in a palace. He goes from the pit to the palace. Not bad, huh? He goes from the pit to the palace, and he starts working for Potiphar. Now, you think about being in Potiphar's house, pretty good place. The Bible says very clearly in Genesis 38 that God was with him through that whole experience as he worked in, in Potiphar's house, uh, chapter 39, that is. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. God's there with him, helping him, but he's still not living that dream yet. He's still not there. It's just kind of like stalling. Uh, things are not happening. Um, and then on top of that, Potiphar's wife, uh, another storm for Joseph, accuses him of something that he did not do. Um, he, can you imagine the temptation that he was under at this point? Um, I don't need to go too far on this. Uh, but, you know, the immorality was right there. He could have taken it. The devil was trying his best to, to intervene or to interrupt. That's the word, to interrupt 
uh, that dream that, cat, that God had had for Joseph. But Joseph stood strong, and, 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 and eventually, uh, because he stood strong, he was able to keep his faith. And we move on to Genesis 40. Um, he ends up going to prison uh, because of the, misaccu- the accusation that was wrong. And, and so all of this unfolds as you go through chapter after chapter in Genesis. And in a lot of ways, it just doesn't seem like everything's going to end up uh, the way God had it planned for Joseph. But the good news is, skipping a little bit ahead today, is that eventually, eventually, things did turn for the good for Joseph Joseph eventually did take the leadership role, going uh, to the last chapter in Genesis 50, going to the last chapter. Joseph eventually had the privilege to be the leader, and eventually his brothers came and they did bow to him, just like the prophecy said. And in verse 15, it says, when Joseph's brothers, uh, chapter 50 now, jumping ahead, Chapter 50, verse 15, when Joseph's brothers, when they saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Yes, evil. It wasn't nice what they did to him. And truth of the matter was, it wasn't nice for what someone did to you too. Unfortunately, sometimes the people that hurt us the most are people in our own family. And sometimes, yeah, that could be a a spouse, an ex-spouse. Sometimes that could be a sibling. That could be a parent, a cousin, an uncle, whatever. Sometimes the hardest pain that we have to deal with comes from people in our own family. Yes, Joseph understands that pain. But God also understands because he was there to help Joseph get through it. Verse 16, Genesis 50. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And then it says, And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Joseph began to cry. In other words, what I'm thinking here is that Joseph had a meltdown because the Spirit of God spoke to his heart about what he should do with his brothers. He needed to forgive them. And the beauty of this whole story is, as I believe, that became a reality for Joseph. He was able to forgive them the trespasses, the things that they had done to him. And that allowed him the ability to be able to be a blessing to his family. Is it possible here today, friends, that in order for things to get moving in the right direction in your family, you just need to choose to forgive? Choose to forgive the ones that have hurt you. Wow. It worked for Joseph. I think it would work for us, too. And so verse 18, then his brothers also went and they fell down before his face and they bowed and worshiped him. And they said, behold, we are your servants, just like the prophecy said came true. But it was 21 years it took for them to finally get to this point. 21 long years. And then I love the next part. It says, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Just take a moment and and look up here at the screen today. Look at that verse and what it says. It is loaded, friends. It is so loaded. I I mean, this is a whole nother sermon. Um, (laughs) Don't tempt me here. (laughs) This could be a whole nother sermon about the implications of this, but I'm just going to sum it up here, and that is is that what happened to Joseph was meant to, to, to interrupt God's plan for him, but it ended up working around so that God could use him to help his family, to save many people alive. It worked out. (laughs) In his time, he makes all things what? 
beautiful. And so through all the ugliness, God was still there. God was still working. Are you up there, God? Yes, I'm still here. All right, I'm going to trust you. Yeah, God was still there every step of the way. And through this experience, it allowed Joseph to be in a place, to be in a place where he could help other people. Wow. And look at this. This is what I got. Um, some of you probably have heard of Max Lucado. Uh, he's written a book that I just treasured. I read this, I think it was last year. It's called, you will Get Through This. Just a wonderful book as far as getting through storms. Um, <laughs> but notice it first begins with evil. The evil happened to Joseph, all right? It's, it's very clear that the, the evil things that were designed to destroy him. But here's the beauty, the equation here. There was God. God came and he did what he, God does. He took the bad stuff and guess what? He brought something good out of it. Isn't that beautiful? You know it, don't you? Romans 8, 28. You know that, right? All things work together for the good. Eventually, there's some good after God comes into the picture and he changes things. Wow, the storm of sin. Could it be that the same is also true? Well, think about this. When you look at his story, Jesus' story, uh, Joseph was a type of Jesus. When you look at his story, he has the same thing going on. <laughs> he had evil. Uh, they, they, were, they were killing him. The crucifixion, we look at it, yeah, because it's a picture, but it was the worst type of capital punishment at the time. Uh, they were, they were uh, trying to end his mission, his dream. But you know what? God took this, and he brought something good out of it. And what's the good? <laughs> the good is that you and I get to go to heaven because of Jesus. You see, that is so true in everything. So take a moment, not to right now, but take a moment and have three columns. Put on the first column to the left. Put evil. Write down something bad that's happened to you. And then the next column, the second column in the middle, put God as your title. And then put under there things about God that you've learned through it. And then the last column to the right, put good and write down something good that came out of it. <laughs> And there's value. There's value in every storm that we go through. Wow, I could say some more today. I'd love to hear your storm story. In fact, today we have the privilege uh, to have someone. Tim, why don't you come on up? I just want to share with you today. Tim has had, uh, yeah, some interesting things happen in his life. Tim Goster is one of our externs here at Stand for Gap. And Tim, I'm going to give you your mic right now. Uh, so I'll give you a chance to use this mic. Just real quick, Tim. Um, last summer, things are going really well. You're looking forward to, uh, yeah, your senior year and everything. But then something crazy happened in your life. A storm happened. And today, I don't think you've publicly been able to talk about it to anyone. But today, God has given you the strength to share about what happened. Share with us. Uh, yeah. Side note, this wasn't the first storm. Um, I've had other storms in my life, and I thought, okay, it's just it's going to be short, like it always is. And uh, this storm was depression. And it started in September of last year, and maybe many of you, you've seen me a lot. Oh, he's always so happy. He's always loud and smiling. He's doing fine. He's fine. Deep down, I was not fine. Um, and I had been through spouts of depression that maybe lasted a day or two. This one kept going and going and going. When I was younger, I looked at people who were depressed, and I thought to myself, why are they depressed? We follow Jesus. Like, what is there to be depressed about? And then I read further in the Bible that he, there were times that Jesus was down, and he had to go spend time with his father. And... Um, I'll be really honest here, folks. Um, there was a point in time where I questioned my faith last semester with God. Why do I believe? How could God let me go so low? I feel so far away. And uh, so for about three months, I was in a very bad place. And my friends know this. I wasn't going to class that much. I was sleeping all the time. 
didn't want to take care of myself physically, emotionally, mentally, was just in a very dark place. And, um, and then something happened. And tell us what happened, Tim. God uses people to touch your life. And um, one of my friends, we hadn't seen each other in a very long time, and it was graduation. And, and many of you know that the graduation at Southern um, and the gym is very small, so they only allow you to have certain tickets. So I was like, oh, well, none of my friends gave me a ticket, which is fine. You know, I'll just, just you know, hang out. And so one of my friends said, hey, I'm not going to graduation too. Okay, cool, so we'll just hang out and go to Yellow Deli. And so we went to Yellow Deli, and we're, this is one of those friends that you can talk with that just get really deep into conversation about Jesus, about life, about what you've learned. And she just starts going on about how she's been dealing with something very similar to me. Um, at the time, I was dealing with a friend of mine who was not treating me well. I was also dealing with anger towards God, anger towards how come I can't graduate in May, anger towards how come this hasn't happened in my life yet, or how come, why is this happening? And she was like, you know, I'm dealing with that too. And she talked about how she was dealing with somebody at work that she didn't like. And how she was dealing with um, a future brother-in-law that she doesn't know how she's going to get along with. And she just went on about her life. But she said to me in Yellow Deli, Tim, I'm so happy. And I was like, but she's going through so much pain. How is she happy? This doesn't make any sense. Like, and then I remembered, that was me two or three years ago, going through similar pain. People would ask me, Tim, like, you're always so happy. And it's because of Jesus, because of Jesus. And for three months, I didn't say that. Wow. Why are you so unhappy? Well, because of this, this, and this, and this. I was so focused on myself, so focused on what I didn't have, so focused on me that I didn't focus on Jesus at all. Um, and it was really scary to go about three weeks without praying. There's some dangerous things that can go on. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I will, I'll be honest with you, I did not want to kill myself. Um, so that, did, that was not even a choice. Like, I was like, no, I don't want to kill myself. But at the same time, I was like, but why is this happening to me? And so we're at Yellow Deli, and my friend just is speaking her heart. And I just sensed the Holy Spirit saying, Tim, you can be healed. Amen. And I'm just sitting here like, and she's telling me, I'm so happy, Tim, and this job is hard, and my future brother-in-law is like, mm, and this is, all this is going on. But I'm just, God has given me peace. And I was like, what happened to me? God changed my life. I became a theology major. I got so happy. He's been working on my heart. How did I go away? And then I just, this tug, this tug on my heart, Tim, that same peace that you had before can be yours again. Amen. Praise and the so Lord. literally in the middle of Yellow Deli, I just start crying. And all of my friends that know me, I am a very tender, emotional dude. So hashtag real men cry. Um, <laughs> and if you don't, that's okay. Do it, do it by yourself in your closet, whatever. But I, I never cried before in a public place. And I just was like, because it was just, it was, I had realized how much I'd pushed God away. And I realized how Jesus was there the entire time, just waiting. I'm going to be right here, Tim. I'm going to be right here. And then when I found it, it was like, okay, let's do this. I'm tired of being stubborn. I'm tired of being angry. And then, then I just... Of course, it's not literal, but you feel that hand of God just pulling Amen. you out of that bog of depression and that bog of misery. And I sat there and I was like, I've been such a fool. And I just remember Jesus is like, do not focus on what you're happening in your past. We're going to focus on your future. And I was just like, wow. So I took the entire Christmas break and just was like, God, I don't like school, but I like to learn. Please help me to be motivated for school. And for the first time ever, came back to school, and I was like, let's do this. Like, I'm not that good at school, but I'm actually wanting to go to class. I'm actually wanting to be motivated. I want to do a lot. Complete 180. And God is so good. Amen. Four weeks of just taking that Christmas break to 
spend a week with my, with my goddaughters and, and just realizing the beauty of life and just, oh, glory be to God. And not going to lie, even, this, even just this week, sometimes the temptation for anger and depression comes back. And Friday morning, I was like, I could just stay in bed and sleep. And <laughs> No, I'm going to go. Let's get up, do something. Like, <laughs> sometimes you have to power through those emotions and make that choice to keep going. But then you got to ask God, Lord, help me. Amen. Tim, we are so grateful that you were willing and able to talk about something that's very dear sensitive issue, a very delicate issue. Uh, I do know that God has provided this opportunity for you right now to talk to anybody here that's going through something similar. What would you say to somebody that's in the pit of a depression, that's stuck, not going anywhere, wondering, you know, God, where are you? What would you say to them today? If you're dealing with depression, I want to personally say to you, don't give up. Amen. Um, don't give up. Because Jesus didn't give up. Amen. And it just... I, I, sometimes I wonder the way that I treated Jesus was if I took the nails and the scars for granted and I felt so sorry because I acted as if Jesus' sacrifice for me was nothing. And it was not a waste of time. And when you realize how patient Amen. and how merciful and how loving Jesus is, yeah. Amen. that is a God that I'm willing to serve. Amen the rest of my life. And even though your mother and father don't, don't want you to go to the mission field sometimes, and you want to go to the Middle East where nobody wants you to go to, you're going to die, Tim. Who cares? <laughs> you're going to see me on that resurrection day. If I die, it doesn't matter. That's right. If you're going through that depression, don't give up because Jesus is never going to give up on you. Amen. Even though your family and your friends and your loved ones and people you think love you give up on you, Jesus is never going to give up on you. Amen. It's so hard being a Christian, guys. But I would rather do that <laughs> Amen. than anything else. Amen. I had my own dreams. I had my own wants and desires. And I just... I see all these NFL players and I see all these people doing wonderful things. I could be me. But then Jesus reminds me, but you wouldn't have me. You wouldn't have peace. You wouldn't have purpose. And so I thank God every day that even though the depression, temptations sometimes come back, go to the word. Go. Don't ignore it. <laughs> And Jesus is waiting Amen. to pick us up. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Precious stuff. Amen. Tim, I think I can speak on your behalf. If there's somebody here today that uh, needs to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, you'd be open to doing that, oh, yeah. right? So just please see oh, yeah. Tim today. Don't and... be afraid to interrupt me in my study. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know. We can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, come on up. Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about preaching about storms is you, you never know who's in the congregation that's gone through something. But I do know that Ron, last time I preached, he says, Pastor Mallory, he says, if you'd give me a chance, I've got a song that will minister to people. And so, Ron, I want to give you the chance to share what God's put on your heart. Um, and that after that, I'll have the closing prayer. Well, that was very moving, Tim. And uh, I don't know how many of you have ever seen me sing before. And sometimes I 
do what Tim did. Hopefully, that won't happen to me today. But I will say, I did something stupid yesterday. You know, I thought, boy, this is spring. So I'll go outside. And I went outside with nothing but a t-shirt on. And guess what happened? I can sing bass. So I'm going to read the words to this song that I sing because I had to change the track that I'm going to sing with to a lower track. And it probably may get a little low for me, but I want you to understand these words because these words are so in line with what Tim said and what the pastor has preached the last couple of weeks. When I saw what lay before me, I cried, Lord, what will you do? I thought that he would just remove it. But he gently led me through. Without fire, there's no refining. Without pain, there's no relief. Without flood, there's no rescue. Without testing, no belief. That part of the song is the beginning of this chorus for this song. It's a very short song. And so, if we can, we'll make it through this with the Lord's help. When I saw what lay before me, I cried, Lord, what will you do? I thought he would just remove it, but he gently led me through. Without fire, there's no refining. Without pain, no relief. Without blood, there's no rescue. Without testing, no through the fire through the flood through the water through the blood through the dry and barren places through life's days and oh so maddening to the pain and through the glory we always tell the story 
Father God, it's hard. It's not easy. But thank you so much that you're with us. Thank you that you were with that little girl, that little baby, 10 month old little baby. Uh, yeah, there she was on the ground, and that she was found. Storm was bad, but God was bigger. Truth of the matter is, we all have our storms that we go through. If we're not in one, we're getting ready to go in one. Soon there will be a storm like none other. And we just thank you so much that if you can be with us in the little storms, you can be with us in the big one. So thank you, Jesus, that you've made it possible for people like Tim to come out of the blues, to come and share today. Thank you for allowing us in our woundedness to share the healing that God gives us, the peace. And Lord, help us as we get ready to go their separate places, Lord, where we live, wherever we're going today, to remember that maybe just somebody is going through something very difficult and they just need a word of encouragement or someone to listen to them. Um, Lord, help us to be a blessing. Um, yeah, so that whatever we've gone through, maybe we can use that to help them to know that there's hope. With every eye closed and head bowed, if you would like to say, Jesus, I want to thank you so much for being my friend in the storm for being there to help me through the tough things in life. I just want to publicly let you know that I appreciate that. If you're that person, I want to invite you to stand right now. And by you standing, you'll say to God that, yeah, publicly before man and before the universe, I want to tell everyone that I'm thankful for my Savior, Jesus. We're standing today by your grace, Lord, and continue to lead us. In your name we pray, amen. Nineteen times on the word today.